2 Samuel chapter number 9. Hallelujah. 2 Samuel chapter number 9. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Just good things happening right now in the body of Christ. Don't let your eyes deceive you. There are good things that are happening. Don't let CNN and all that, don't let those things deceive you. There are good things that are happening in the body of Christ in the earth right now. Amen? Amen. So 2 Samuel chapter number 9, and I'm going to read quite a bit of scripture. That's why I'm going to, uh, we, we won't ask you to stand up this morning. Uh, but we're going to read quite a bit, and then we're going to talk about it. We're going to take a walk through the scripture and talk about it. And get everybody to the launch pad. 2 Samuel chapter number 9. And I'll start at verse number 1, and I'm going to read from the New King James Version of the Bible. It says, <clears throat> so David, I apologize, now David said, is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David the king, said to him, are you Ziba? He said, yes, at your service. Look what it says in verse number 3. Then the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom, I might, to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. Everybody say lame in his feet. So there is still someone that's out there that's lame in his feet. Verse 4. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he is in the house of Makar, uh, the son of Emil, in Lodabar. Everybody say Lodabar. Lodabar. Say it again, Lodabar. Lodabar. So there is a son. He's in the house of Emil in Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Makir, the son of Emil, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, this is the son, when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. He got real humble. He was real afraid. Then David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, here is your servant. So David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore. Everybody say restore. restore. Every time I see the word restore in the Bible, it makes my heart skip a beat because I go to a church named Restoration. And the essence of the mission of this church is to restore. Listen to me. You have been restored to restore. Amen. Can I say that again? You have been restored to restore. <clears throat> God restored you so that you can restore someone else. And if you haven't been restored, he is right here, able and willing right now to restore you, to restore your situation, whatever, so that you can feel comfortable with going and restoring someone else because that is your God-given mission. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So look what he says <clears throat> in verse number 7. I'll go back to where we stopped that restore. Restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then he bowed himself and said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? Look at that now. I don't want to jump off into that. That's going to get me distracted. But here's the man of God. He's about to bless him. He's saying, why are you, I'm a dead dog. Why are we even having this conversation? How many times do we talk ourselves out of the blessing that God puts right in front of us? Verse number 9, and the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house. You, therefore, and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Oh, this is getting hard for me. Watch this now. Because of one man, everybody else got blessed. Yes, sir. It was just one man. Just because of Mephibosheth, it, it, it was because of a relationship. Just because of Mephibosheth and everyone else being connected to him was the blessing multiplied. Yes, sir. So David starts talking. He's saying, is there anyone that is left of the house of Jonathan or Saul that I can bless? They identify Mephibosheth. And now because Ziba is a servant and is connected to Mephibosheth, guess who else gets to be blessed? Him and his 15 sons. Mm, I'm going to have to work on that for just a moment. That's a tongue, tongue full. That's a tongue twister to say bless Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was blessed. I may have to separate those two words. Pray for me. Pray for me, church. Pray for me. Verse number 11. Then Ziba said to the king, according 
to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Verse 12, Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all, the, and all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth, don't miss this, verse 13. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both his feet. I just, I, I, I just better take a 30-second time now. And he was lame in both his feet. God doesn't miss, he doesn't miss an opportunity to grab our attention with a detail. So we see the description of what's going to happen. David is going to promote him. David's saying, your sons are going to work the field. Your sons are going to work the field. You're going to be blessed. You're going to bring in the harvest, et cetera, et cetera. And for Mephibosheth, he's going to stay at my table. He's going to eat here like one of the king's sons. And then watch this. At the end of the passage, it says that he sat there, he ate at the king's table, and he was lame in both his feet. Pointing to the fact, gosh, I don't want to get too far ahead of this, that really he was not qualified to be where he was. Someone had told him, you know what, you're, you're designed to, to launch out, to go to the next level. Uh, that he, was, he was hearing that. That was in his heart because that's in the heart of everyone, whether you believe it or not. It, the Holy Ghost really is talking at your heart to say, I do have a next level. I do have a next assignment. I do have a next business. I do have a next relationship. There is a next for everyone. But too many times we listen to our situation, we listen to the fact that we're lame in both our seats, and in, in our feet, excuse me, and we disqualify ourselves from what God has prepared for us. Listen to me. Stop. Don't think yourself just a little ordinary anybody with no power, with no ability, and with no authority. That is not true. Your words have power. Why do I know your words have power? Because you were created in the image and the likeness of Almighty God. Yes. Watch this, you all. When God was doing some work in Genesis, and I won't go there for too long, but when God was creating stuff, do you not realize that when he was going to create uh, ground, he spoke to the ground. When he was going to create the stars, he spoke to the stars. When he was going to create the moon, he spoke to the moon and to the sun and all these things. But when God got ready to create man, God talked to himself. He said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And I say that just to say that you are bad beyond belief. You are bad beyond your own comprehension or understanding. So don't take lightly your words. You may not have a collar. You may not have a title. You may not have an office. Nor do you need any of those things to turn your world upside down. All you need is an ear to hear, a heart to understand, and the faith to say what it was you heard God speak into your ear. Hallelujah. Now, I told you all, you know, I'm kind of a wild, you know, charismatic kind of cat. I just like to, I like to get with him. Amen? I like to, I just do. And I wasn't this way until, until really, until I uh, came into a relationship with Jesus Christ, if I can be honest with you. Yes, you can ask my wife. I was fairly boring when we went to the club. <laughs> the discotheque. <laughs> Nowadays, we call it the lounge. I was fairly boring when, when we went there. You know, I just got my little, did my little thing. <laughs> it just wasn't a whole lot of anything. What are we going to do tonight? Nothing. Where you want to go to eat? Wherever you want to go. I was just very, just very low, just laid back and just low key. I don't know why. I didn't play it that way. It was just, you know, she's doing all this. and I'm like, sister, come, number one, come back this way. I'm, I'm here. Come back. I just couldn't, I just couldn't, I couldn't get with that. It just wasn't, it was not the way that I was wired. But I kid you not, you all. I had a man of God pray with me. He saw something in me, and he had the faith to say what it was that he saw. And I said yes to Jesus Christ, job, education, all that stuff, and he revolutionized really the person that I am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I had to work very hard to be very docile and calm when I'm in certain settings. I can't be charismatic when I'm with my board. Oh, come on, you all. Yes, sir. 
I, 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 can't, I can't lay hands on everyone and, and pray in the Holy Ghost when I'm in a corporate setting or in a higher educational setting. However, he does give me insight that opens up great doors of opportunity, uh, even for the CEO, the president, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't say that braggadociously. Really, I say that to say anything that he does for one, he desires to do for everyone. Let me say that again. Anything that he desires, the Bible says that God is not a respecter of persons. So anything that he does for one, he desires to do for everyone. Everybody say this, I believe God. I believe God. Okay, so I remember being this kind of this young uh, preacher. Don't worry, I'm going to go. We're going to bring Mephibosheth into this. It's all going to make sense. But I remember this, and there's something that I wanted to share with you all uh, based on a note that I got earlier on in the week from someone. Now, how many of you know that none of us completely, 100%, have it all together? Amen. Can we admit that this morning? I'll say that for myself. I don't know about you all. I do not have it all together. I have issues, I have hang-ups, and I have challenges, and God still loves me. And do you know this, that in the middle of your issues, your hang-ups, and your challenges, God will still use you right where you are. Right? So I remember this, you know, just really a brand new Christian a uh, fairly new believer, but knew I was called into the ministry. I knew it. And when I saw it, um, it was so real that I tried to deny it. I wouldn't even talk about it with my wife. Yeah. And she knew it at the same time, and she wouldn't even talk about it. And really, we had kind of come to a consensus. Sean, look, we can barely take care of ourselves talking about being somebody's preacher. We're going to just put that. We, I don't even know how subconsciously we had that conversation and decided to suppress that and put that on the back burner. But we did. I don't know how we did that. We did. We, without having a conversation, said, wait a minute, we're called to do something. Oh, let's not talk about that. Put that away and never bring that up again. I don't know how we did that. But do you know what happened? God kept presenting opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to reach inside of us and to pull out of us what he wanted to be put on display yes, in front of the entire world. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. yes, sir. I didn't say neighborhood. I said in, in front of the entire yes, world. Sir. See, I spent time with my pastor, and he'd been working on my mindset, and I can't, I can't talk small because if I talk small, I'm going to live small. And don't get, don't, don't, don't get hung up monetarily living small. I mean living large on a big scale so I can make an impact with a big check. For, for all the money haters out there, with a big check, glory to God. I don't know about you, I don't serve a poor king, and I don't want to be a poor king. But anyway, I got to go quickly. So I got this note. Again, we just remember um, there will be little things that the Lord would show us, and he would, he would say things and say, go say this to this person. I'm like, what? What in the world? Go say it. What? There was a friend of mine, and we were both in the military at this time, and we had the same rank, and I loved my military life. And it was very easy because I'm an order person. And I remember this. Um, one morning I was in prayer, and my friend, I was just about on that. I'd made that decision. We were going to follow God and leave the military. Don't worry, this is going to go somewhere. And I remember my friend was not going to. He was going to stay for his career. And I was in prayer, and the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, go and promote him. And what he was saying, I had a military insignia because people were always trying to tell me, this is where we're going to put you based on what we're seeing. <laughs> Everybody say Lodavar. Lodavar. Say it again, Lodavar. Lodavar. Mephibosheth had two lame feet. How do you think Mephibosheth got to Lodavar? <laughs> I, know, I know it's going to mess you up. Someone carried him there. And the reason that they carried him there is they assessed his situation and said, you know what, the only place that's going to be good for you is this place called Lodavar. What does Lodabar mean? Lodabar was a place, it meant a pastureless place. There was no provision there. It meant a barren place. It meant a place of communication. There was no, no communication flowing in, and there was no communication flowing out. So because in the midst of a little war that was taking place, someone falls. He didn't do this to himself. Someone falls. He hurts himself, or he's hurt. He's lame in both his legs. They assess the situation and say, you know what, you're no good but to be taken and to carried and left in this place called Lodabar. Wow. Remember that. Stay with that thought. So I go down, 
and I promote my friend because uh, someone was placing me somewhere in the military based on how they assessed me. Oh, you're, you look like you can do this. You look like you can have this. You look like you're designed for this. So they kept giving me all these pins. We're gonna, you need to have this because you're going to make this rank real soon. And I can see that the military is going to be a good fit for you. And it just didn't, it didn't, can I say it this way? It didn't jive with my spirit, man. I just, when I thought about it, I was like, oh, I don't think I'm going to be doing this forever. So anyway, I go and I promote my friend. And when I promote him, I remember kind of saying to him, and this won't be the last promotion. Do you all not know that that gentleman, <clears throat> not only did he get promoted for that next rank out of the zone, which meant before his time, he achieved the maximum rank so quickly that the Air Force had to write an exception to allow him to have the rank. Everybody say exception. exception. <laughs> wow. It's going to make sense. So they had to write an exception to give the man his rank. Now, that wasn't me. I just happened to be the person that God spoke to to deliver the message. When God, before God fashioned that brother to hit the face of the earth, God already had in mind that he was going to allow him to be successful in his military career. I just happened to be the person at that one point in time to go and to share a message and to see that message manifested and lived out. So I'll go to another story just very quickly. We had another friend in the same town, and I remember he was a phenomenal. He, he reminds me of, I, I love these people. I want to be like them. I can't be like them. He reminds me of like Sherlandra and Josh, Josh and Sherlandra. You know, they're music producers. Y'all better get hold of them before they blow up. I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. See, I'm in, so when they blow up, I'm, I'm already in, because I, I, they'll bring me to the green room in the back. They'll do all that, because I'm, I'm already there with them. But anyway, so we had this, um, this young friend, phenomenal musician, writer, producer. He does all that stuff. He, he's just like them. And um, God had brought us into favor with some people, and some people sold into our lives, free of charge, a grand piano, a, a pretty nice grand piano, too. Just said, here, we just want to bless you. We like you. We love your family. We love what you all represent. Here's this piano. So we take the piano, and we'd already had eyes on these people. We said, you know what? We're going to bless them. We're going to give them this grand piano. So we give them just no thought whatsoever. We knew. Give them the grand piano. God will never give you something that if you give it away, he won't give it back to you. Don't, don't get all afraid, right? So we give away the, the grand piano, and it's, it's no big deal. And, oh, by the way, someone did give us a very nice grand piano. <laughs> Anyway, let me read this note for you. And this is a note from the young man. Because in addition to just giving him a grand piano, there was just some words that the Lord had laid on our hearts to share with him. Here's what he says. Over 12 years ago, you told me just to give God something to work with. You said that if I totally trust him and write music, you believe that I would never have to work for anyone else. I've never done it because of a lack of faith and fear. Hmm, I've never done it because of a lack of faith and fear. It's going to get better. Watch this. As we prepare to transition, I'm finally prepared to mentally trust God and to walk into my purpose, spiritual gifting, and believe that now is the time. Thanks for the word of encouragement. Can't wait to see uh, a prophecy fulfilled. Everybody say God's a God of purpose. God's a God of purpose. So God, for, for some reason, is drawing all sorts of great people all together. Do you know where he's drawing this dynamic young couple to with, with their giftings and their talent that God gave us a word to share and a gift in our heart to get them, they're transitioning to Charlotte, North Carolina. Wow. Oh, y'all, never mind. I, I, never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Wow. Never mind. That's all right. And, oh, by the way, he already knows. We've already made the connection so that they can have... And, and, and more from a spiritual covering aspect so that they can link up with two great generals that I just happen to know in Charlotte, North Carolina. That was 12 years ago. Let me say that again. My goodness. That was 12 years ago. So we know that David's life was riddled with lots of controversy. David's here. He's having a conversation. He's trying to bless Mephibosheth from Lodabar, all right? 
But before David got there, think about this, you all. David was anointed to be the king over Israel in the midst of lots of controversy. Keep in mind, David was only ever, the, he was the second king of Israel. You had King Saul, and then you had King David. And when the transition and the transfer of power occurred, let's just say it this way, that it did not go very smoothly. Because Saul essentially lost the kingdom, he lost the presence of God, and he lost the power of God. Stay with me, I'm going to go somewhere very quickly. So he loses the favor of God, if you would. There's nothing more earth-shattering than losing the favor of God. Let me say it this way, losing the advantage of God. Listen to me, you all. The presence of God in your life gives you a distinct advantage over everyone, yes, over everyone and over everything. So David goes through a very difficult transition. Now imagine this. He's going through this transition. There's a prophet by the name of Samuel that shows up at his house. Pay attention to this. Samuel comes and talks to his father, Jesse, and says, Jesse, bring all your sons out here. And so Jesse goes, and he brings all of his sons out for the lineup except David. Everybody say except. except. Say it like you mean it, except. except. Now think about that. Think about how poor David felt when his father is instructed to bring all of your sons out for the lineup because we are about to, to anoint the next king of Israel, and David is not even given any consideration in the, initially. Wow. Think about that. You hear someone say, go get all your boys and bring them out here. And they're all gathered up, and I'm still in the field doing my chores. Oh, how does that make me feel? What's going on that my own father does not even, what, does not, maybe he, he's not my daddy? Do I have another daddy? I mean, can't, think about all the things that are going on in David's little mind. But watch this. When God has a plan, it's only the plan of God that's going to stand. You and I can try to orchestrate it. You and I can try to illustrate it. You and I can try to put it together. It's only the plan of God that's going to stand. So David initially watches his brothers be considered for the position that God had already selected him for. Eventually, they try to pour the oil and it doesn't work. They try to anoint this one. It doesn't work. They try to anoint this one. It doesn't work. And Samuel's saying, Jesse, look what's going on. Surely you got to have somebody else here. And so finally, very reluctantly, Jesse calls for old David. And they bring David up, and then instantly the, the vial of oil, the oil begins to flow, and Samuel anoints David as the king of Israel. Yeah. Now watch this. Uh, prior to him being anointed, Samuel tells Saul, listen, God is not with you. As a matter of fact, he's chosen someone better than you. Man, it's one thing to lose your job. It's another thing to, be, to lose your job and ten, then to be informed, not only are you fired, we found someone better than you. So David gets this promotion in the midst of all of this controversy and turmoil. Look at what's happening. This is a very, pay attention to, to this dynamic. So on one side, you've got one side of the camp that is celebrating the fact that David has become the king. And then on the other side of the camp, you got another group that is very upset over the fact that David has become the king. So as quick as you see your support rising is as quick as you see your opposition rising. Oh, come on, somebody. So you get promoted to do bigger and better things. The bigger and the better you become, the more people are going to take an issue with what it is you now have an opportunity to do, to, to do and to, to be. Does that make sense to everyone? So he's growing on this hand, and he's growing on the other hand at the same time. It's the same thing that happened to Jesus. There was a certain level of hate for Jesus when he was doing no miracles. But when Jesus started performing miracles, that, and he started doing stuff that other people couldn't do. He started giving away backpacks and blessing people and going to the jail and doing all these things that other people couldn't do. Man, people start taking an issue with that. Listen to me. The bigger you go and the more that you do, the more that you are going to be persecuted. But it's the thing that reminds you that you are the most Christ-like. Because Jesus says, listen, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. Let me keep going. Go to Isaiah 55 very quickly. Isaiah chapter 55. And let me make this statement as you're going there. In spite of your situation, God is always willing to make an exception for you. Can I say that one more time? In spite of your situation, God is always willing to make an exception for you. Begin to develop an attitude that you are the exception. 
I say that again, develop an attitude that says, I am the exception. When facing limitations or restrictions, frame your confession uh, on this fact that I am the exception. I understand that you have rules, but those rules don't apply to me. I am the exception. You're trying to start a business. Your business plan doesn't look quite right. I am the exception. You're trying to get into a relationship. This relationship was messed up. I am an exception. You're in need of healing. The doctors are saying they can't do what they won't do. You say, I am. The Hallelujah. And you're the exception based on what it is God is thinking about you, not what your situation is saying to you. Oh, my God, church, let me say that again. You're the exception based on the fact of what God is thinking about you versus what your situation is saying to you. Look what he says in Isaiah 55. I don't think the way you think. I'm reading from the Message Bible. I don't think the way you think. The way you work isn't the way that I work. God's decree. For as the sky soar high above the earth, so the way I work surpasses the way you work. And the way I think is beyond the way you think. Just as rain and snow descend from the skies and don't go back until they've watered the earth, doing their work of making things grow and blossoms, producing seed for farmers and food for the hungry. So will the words that come out of my mouth not come back empty-handed. They will do the work I sent them to do. They'll complete the assignment that I gave them. Oh, my gosh. Can I illustrate this just very quickly? I remember being a boy, and my father would not speak to us in left and right. He would only talk north, south, east, and west. Right? He wouldn't say, go to the left side of the garage and get this. He would say, go to the north side of the garage and get this. So I remember we were, we were building, um, we were renovating the back end of a house and we needed some siding. And he would say stuff like, go to the southeast corner of the garage and look two feet to the north and I left a hammer there. Or I left something there. So you would go in there and you would rustle around and you come back and say, I, I can't find it. And my dad, and I have a lot of his manners, and he would suck his teeth, and he'd say, boy, I'm going to tell you one more time. You go back into the southeast corner of the garage, you look to the north by two meters and get such and such. And you go back in there again, and you look around, and you bring something out, and it wasn't the right thing. By this time, he had pulled his belt off. He said, I'm going to tell you one more time. You go back into that garage, you go to the southeast corner, you look two millimeters to the right and bring back such and such. Well, when you came back the last time, first of all, when you went back, you were crying. <sighs> <laughs> you was just freaking out, right? Because you, I mean, you was just lost. You couldn't understand it. And then you go back and just had to take your beat. I'm sorry, I couldn't understand it. And it'd be wham, 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 wham. All because you didn't understand it. Let me break it down to you. Here's how the word works. The word is never going to go to the southeast corner, look two millimeters to the right, and not bring back what it is that God is expecting. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. It's not going to come back to God until it has completed the will of God in the earth. It can't go back until God fulfills what it is he designed us to do. He said it can't come back. He said, see, I don't think the way you think. My word can't come back to me until it's done what I designed it to do. That's my faith. That's what I hold on to. When my situations look kind of messed up and it looks like it's not working, wait a minute. The word's not done here yet. The word's not done here yet. The word's not done here yet. Hallelujah. Woo, because God doesn't think the way that I think, man. We give up. God doesn't give up. Because God's seen the finished work. Hallelujah. Oh, my goodness. Say, I'm the exception. So we understand Lodabar. We understand Mephibosheth. We understand how Mephibosheth got there, right? Uh, this is how Mephibosheth ends up in Lodabar. Here's how he ended up in Lodabar. Don't let people do this to you. He ended up in Lodabar because someone looked at him and they counted him out. They said, you have no value. You have no opportunity. You don't have the right credentials. You don't have enough of a down payment. Uh, you don't have, you know, the right experience. And they counted him out. And when they counted him out, they put him in a place uh, to hang out with a bunch of other people who had been counted out. <laughs> do you all remember that? Remember that Christmas, uh, I think it was Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And they had that place, remember, it was called the Island of Misfit Toys. And, and everybody was singing that same song on that island. Why am I such a misfit? I just want to be a dentist. Y'all don't know the song. Okay, never mind. 
But anyway, this was the place where they discarded everything that didn't look like me, didn't walk like me, didn't talk like me, didn't shout hallelujah like me, didn't dress like me. They put them all together. They colonized them. And see, we have a tendency to do that, things that we don't understand. We put them in a colony together and banish them somewhere. And this is what happened to Mephibosheth. They saw his two lame feet, and they disqualified him from service in the king's palace. Stop letting people and their thoughts and their ideologies push you into Lodabar when you are designed to be operating in Jerusalem. Listen, you're not going to get me in the Lodabar, glory to God. Not only was it a place where there was no pasture, there was nothing green, nothing to feed me, nothing to sustain me, it also says there was no communication flowing in and out. And every now and then, you need somebody to remind you of how good the God is that you serve so that you can build yourself up. Oh, my goodness. Are y'all getting what I'm saying? Do I just need to calm down? I'm sorry that I can't. Every now and then, you need somebody to get right up in your end to tell you yourself that you are the goodness of God manifested in the earth. Glory to God. Don't let people push you into Lodabar. I don't care what they did to the five or the ten or whatever. Don't let them push you into Lodabar. Whew. Three things very quickly, and then I'm going to close in six minutes and 58 seconds. Here we go. Number one, God is always looking for someone to favor. <sighs> Might as well be me. I'll take it. It might as well be me. God is always looking for someone to favor, and it might as well be me. Watch this. Do you know that a real king is very uneasy when he's not blessing people? Now, y'all, <laughs> check this out. David had been fighting ever since he became the king. He had been at war for like 23 years from the time that he became the king. The minute he got a break in the action, he says, surely there's got to be somebody around here that I can bless. You all, he could have went on vacation. He, he could have he done anything. Let's go cut some coconuts down. Let's drink some coconut milk. Let's go get a suntan. Let's do something. But he says right after the battle has stopped, let me find somebody. It's got to be somebody that I can bless. A king is uneasy when he's not blessing people. Woo, now listen to me. We all should be uneasy when we're not blessing people. I should be restless when I'm not changing someone's life. I shouldn't feel good about myself if I'm not being a blessing to someone. I haven't been at war. Nobody's throwing spears at me. I don't have to sleep with my armor on. I should be uncomfortable if I'm not being a blessing in someone's life. It's always in the heart of a king to favor people. Number two, whoo, your covenant with God qualifies you for favor. <laughs> Mephibosheth didn't even have a direct relationship with David but David was in covenant with his father Jonathan and because of that covenant it positioned him to be blessed yeah, yeah. can I remind you of this that you are in covenant with God because of your big brother Jesus Christ yeah. and because of that covenant you have been positioned to be blessed yes, sir. Yeah. oh yeah. Woo. let the church say amen. amen we were saying the old church let the church say amen again <laughs> Point number three. Oh, I love this. God is always speaking to someone on your behalf. Hallelujah. Oh, you all, if you don't believe it, please write that down and make that a confession. Lord, I thank you that you're always speaking to someone on my behalf. Lord, I thank you that you are always speaking to someone on my behalf. Lord, I thank you that you are always speaking to someone on my behalf. Lord, I thank you that you are always speaking to someone on my behalf. Do you not know that it is God using man in the earth to bless you and to favor you? God doesn't break his rules. He's just not up in heaven with a big magic wand and moving things around and separating and whatnot. God speaks to the heart of men to bring you into places of great favor so that you can maximize yourself and become the truest you. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to say this in three minutes and 58 seconds. Say, God's speaking to someone on my, on my behalf. Say it again like you mean it. God is speaking to someone on my behalf. Third time, God is speaking to someone on my behalf. Do you know how we actually landed here in Fayetteville, Arkansas? I don't have time to say the whole story, but I will just tell you this. Uh, soon to be Bishop Steve Halk, uh, we met him several years ago. 
and he pastors thousands of people. All right? Do you know how hard it is to know the names of thousands of people? Do you know how hard it is to know the names of the children of thousands of people? If I look at you funny and I say, hey, brother, I've forgotten your name. <laughs> Tell me your name. Okay? No, I'm, I'm being serious. But I'm going to show you the power of God. This man pastors thousands of people. He travels literally all over the world. We have never been, quote, unquote, members of his church. But God speaks to the heart of men on our behalf. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just one Sunday out of the blue, we contemplated two things. Are we going to go to IHOP and eat breakfast, or are we going to go to church at Harvest Church in Kansas City? So on one side, I really wanted some French toast, fried eggs, bacon, and hash browns, or was I going to go to church? God is always speaking to someone on my behalf. And watch this, because we have a kingdom assignment on our lives, God's not just speaking to anyone on your behalf. God is speaking to kings on your behalf, people that can move things, people that can situate things, people that can give you access to resources and information and opportunities that you wouldn't otherwise have, right? So it's IHOP or am I going to go to church? It's French toast, bacon and eggs and hash browns or am I going to go to church? We made, praise the Lord, we made the decision. Now, when I say that they pastor, he pastors thousands of people, when you walk in that sanctuary and it's full, you can't see me from Adam. I mean, you just can't. I don't stand out or anything. I know I got a good-looking smile and I got a little swagger and whatnot, but I don't. I know what it is. See, God's taking me up. The haters got to come up, right? I know. I know. I know. I said it. I know. I know. It's all right. It's all right. But anyway, we walk into that big sanctuary, and Pastor, soon to be Bishop Halp, is a man of order. He, he doesn't do things. It's, it's one, two, three, and this is what it's going to be. We walked into the back of that big old church, and he stopped. They was in, in uh, praise and worship and offering and whatnot, and he stopped on the microphone. He said, Warrensburg, Missouri. That's where we were from. He, he didn't remember our name. But watch this. He said, Warrensburg, Missouri, God puts you on my heart to pray for you this morning. Get up here and see me. God will always speak to great men on your behalf. And what did he do? He opened the door. He, he exposed us to people, places, and things that we would have never otherwise seen. Watch this. I'm about to close on this. I think it's Proverbs 21 that says it this way. It says that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And as the river turneth, so does God do to that king's heart. What's he saying? God's saying that the same way I control how a river flows is the same way that I control the heart of that king. You don't have to have a conversation. You don't have to have a relationship. When I get you on my mind, which, oh, by the way, all of you are on his mind right now, there are kings that I'm speaking to right now on your behalf. And there are directions and there are changes and there are exceptions that, that they need to grant. And I am doing all those things on your behalf and you don't even know it yet. That's what we mean by the declaration, that great people are willing to help, help, help us. Some of them don't even know it yet. I'm not going to give up because I trust God that at the right time and in the right way, God is going to provide. I'm telling you that God is speaking to great people on your, on your behalf to bring you into great places. Hallelujah. I'll say this quickly and then I'll close. Everybody say exception. exception. Say exception. exception. Put your hand on your heart. Say, I'm the exception. I'm the exception. One more time, I'm the exception. I'm 